Hi, welcome to Lamar University. Welcome to Lamar University and the Jason Project. I am Lauren Laher. My name is Katie Library. Today, we are going to investigate one of our most important and, and most, most endangered, endangered habitats. Texas wetlands. We will join Jason explorers from across Southeast Texas as they venture from the freshwater wetlands upstream down to the saltwater wetlands on the coast. We will start by investigating the swamps and sloughs in the Big Thicket National Preserve in Coons. Next we'll travel to the transitional wetlands at Shangri-La Botanical Gardens in Orange. Then we'll wade in the saltwater nursery of Trinity Bay at Anahuac. Later we'll see the top natural predator in our wetlands on a trip to the J.D. Murphy Wildlife Management Area in Port Arthur. And we will learn how that species acts as a guard dog for the nesting water waterfowl at High Island. We'll wrap up our wetland investigations with a visit to the Coastal Fisheries Research Lab on Pleasure Island. So now, get ready. So now, get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. So we get into Texas, Texas wetlands. Trinity Bay in Anahuac, Texas, students line up to board the Smith Point for the chance of a lifetime, a chance to be a scientist, an explorer, and a discoverer. Today it's their job to find out what lives beneath the surface of Trinity Bay. They use binoculars and maps to investigate their surroundings. The students learn that Trinity Bay is an estuary. Uh, an estuary is pretty much where salt water and fresh water meet. It's a mix pretty much of both environments. An estuary is an area where fresh and salt water mix and it happens to be a nursery ground for many species that live out in that area. Through a process called seining, they find dozens of tiny creatures that live in the estuaries. From shrimp to comb jellies and parasites to fish, these students have discovered life below the turbid waters. Yeah, they were seining and they were going against the wind and. They caught this small mullet. My best experience on this trip was going through the marsh and seeing what kind of organisms lived in there and how we could help it maintain its, well, maintain the habitat in that area. We find all kinds of species here from clams, oysters, shrimp, flounder, trout, and those of course go on up to your bigger species and go on to the land with all of your seabirds, geese, ducks, ibis, all kinds of other birds. Wetlands are extremely important to the health of our, of our planet. They provide many services for the ecosystems, not only for the animals and plants that live here, but also for animals and plants in other parts of the world and throughout the ocean. Students also got a chance to measure the salinity and turbidity of the water. All right, right now we're checking how much salt is in the water right here. Salinity? The salinity of the water and Right here, it's there's 11.6 or 11.2, 11.5. Just have to wait for it to settle down. <laughs> About 11.5. That's the salinity of the water right here. And we're ready, so go ahead and take our measurement. Lower it till you can't see it anymore or can't tell the difference. One more. There. Okay. Stop. About 22. Centimeters. 22 centimeters. Now. What did we say turbidity was? Oh. The suspended particles in the water. Okay, the amount of suspended particles. Now we can only see 22 centimeters down. What if we were in Florida? You could see, see like 30 feet. feet. <laughs> okay, much different because their turbidity is more or less? Less. Less, less turbid water. So the turbidity here, does that mean that our water's polluted? No. 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 It could be like nutrients or? And minerals. That's right. We've got all the sediments, nutrition, and that's what allows our marshes to be so productive. The best thing I learned today was pretty much the effect that uh, the percentage of salt water has on the effect of life. Um, the more salt water that's in the water, um, it kills certain plants and if those plants are around, 
then that uh, enables certain animals to live in that habitat as well. The students help restore and preserve the wetlands by planting California bulrush and other plants. Today, I guess the, the best thing to do today was uh, hmm, probably whenever we went and used the same to catch all the little fishes and then we went and planted some of the plants. It was pretty fun digging the hole in the water and just being all out in the marsh area. <laughs> if we're going to leave something for our children, then we need to make sure that those nurseries are intact. And the only way sometimes that we can do that is to restore what we've already damaged. What we've got here are American bulrush seeds. Different from the California bulrush, but still the same. And here are the seeds. And ducks eat these, but they're too hard to chew. See, Liz? Chew? Yeah, I got one already. They're too hard to chew, so they have to swallow them. And then they'll swallow gravel after it, and then they'll use their stomach to kind of crunch it up. And that way they get the nutrients still from the seeds, even though they can't chew them and get them that way. But you just can't even bite down on it, it'll just stop. Okay. My best experience today was being able to walk on the marsh, inside of the marsh, and being able to see all of the organisms, how they adapt and how they are born in the nursery. The biggest uh, importance of the wetland is that it's a nursery for most of the species that live in the bay or live offshore uh, on the continental shelf. So 90% of the species that live on the shelf, including the ones that we eat, uh, redfish and shrimp, spend part of their life cycle here in the, the estuary. Uh, so it serves as a nursery for those babies. Students use a plankton net to catch creatures for a closer look under the microscope. This is a plankton net. It has very fine material. We're gonna put it over the side. Water will go through the hoop, down and collect any specimens, algae, plankton, diatoms in the container so we'll be able to see them. So we're going to let it over the net, over the side. Y'all try not to bang the side of the boat. Lower it on out and we're going to let it drag back in the water and we're going to pull this net actually for about four minutes. You can see how much we got just from that little bit of water. Now that the expedition is over, these students can take with them an appreciation for the wetlands and all the creatures that live here. The students can now call themselves explorers, discoverers, and restorers. Welcome to Big Thicket National Preserve. Um, today we're going to be studying ecosystem analysis and trying to use your skills as scientists to figure out the difference between the wetlands that we have here at Big Thicket National Preserve. All the wetlands we'll see today are freshwater systems. We'll be going into a cypress slough, a bay gall, and a wetland pine savanna. So let's go. I know what a habitat is? Let me see your hand. Habitat. Go ahead, Brad. So everything an animal needs to survive. Correct. Everything an animal needs to survive. That's its world. That's where it lives. That's its habitat. And the Kirby Nature Trail was uh, named Kirby after John Henry Kirby, the very first big timber baron that started the uh, lumber industry, the timber industry in southeast Texas. And as you well know, that's one of our major economic resources today. Um, this area was set aside for his employees as an employee recreation area. So that's why today, 100 years after he set it aside, we're able to see a mature forest and the wetlands that are associated with it. Okay, 
Okay, one of the things that we need to know about any type of a um, wetland area, we need to know how fast the water percolates through the soil. Can anybody guess or hypothesize how fast the water is going to go through this soil here? Pretty fast. We're going to see. For the percolation test, uh, Monica is going to pour all the water in at once as soon as Kelsey says go and we're going to time it, see how long it takes for 200 milliliters, write that on your chart, of water to go down into the soil. Okay. Uh, 13.5 seconds. 13.85 seconds, write that under bagel, water percolation. pH is um, the level of acid or al alkalinity in a substance. It could be in your shampoo, you know, they say pH balanced for your hair. It could be in your milk or your vinegar. What do you think is more acid, milk or vinegar? Okay, that's a no-brainer. So all you really want to do is shove it all the way down so the sensors are in the soil, and then you're going to read the pH on the, the top there. So just shove it down and see what it says. Oh, put your hand on top of it. Push as hard as you can. There you go. What kind of reading are you getting on that? A little closer to five. It's kind of between four and five. Between four and five. Yeah. Can anybody tell? By just looking, we're in the Cypress Slough now. Um, what's the biggest difference, just observing, from between a bagel and a Cypress Slough? Well, in a bagel, the water just kind of stands in one place, but in the slough, wherever it comes from, it just flows kind of. That's right, exactly. In the bagel, the water sits, and in the slough, it runs through, in and out. Uh, the reason for uh, doing the salinity test in the Cypress Slough here is so that we can verify that this is a freshwater slough. The other Argonauts um, in Southeast Texas were at Shangri-La Gardens and that was a whole different type of ecosystem because they had salt in the water. It was called brackish water, it's half salt, half fresh. Um, but yeah, they saw very similar species, cypress trees and a lot of the same species that we're seeing here. So some species can survive in brackish water and some and, and salt water. Salt water and fresh water, both. And there's probably some species here that you won't find down there, and I'm sure there's many species there that you won't find up here because of that difference in salinity. Checking the pH level. It's on five right now. Typically, the bagel is about a half a point more acid than the slough. I guess it doesn't. Never mind. We're about to find the rate of percolation in the dirt okay. or the soil. All right, sorry. Go. But it's got a lot of clay that's holding that water. It's not rushing through like it did before. Yeah, it's still not done. See, there's a ranger teaching all the little students. What we are in, we're in a savanna. We're gonna, what we're looking at are picture plants. What it is, there's a nectar in it that's uh, very sweet smelling and in, it attracts insects. And what these insects do is they crawl in through the top of the pitcher plant and there's some hairs on the inside of them. The hairs point down 
and there's a liquid in the bottom of the plant that can dissolve these insects. Picture plant uses those insects for nutrients uh, to survive. The pitchers die every year and grow new pitchers every year. Um, you can see the nice, beautiful green ones like this. Those are the fresh ones for this year. Some of them are kind of reddish. They're beautiful colors. This is, a, is it a five-line skink or a blue tail? It's, I think it's a blue tail. A blue tail skinks. Live in the soft soils. That one probably hasn't been hatched more than a day or two, don't you think? She likes slimy. <laughs> The things when we developed the nature classroom in 1996 is that we wanted it to be an experience uh, into a cypress swamp and heading toward this goal what we did is we said why don't we take the students to our facility by boat so the nature classroom developed uh, as uh, a boat ride into a cypress swamp we took them from the city park in orange down through adams bio which is a cypress tupelo swamp to the nature classroom which is, just happens to be situated right in the middle of one of the better cypress swamps in Orange County. Letcher Stark protected this. He was the founder of the Stark Foundation but he was, uh, he knew very early in, in the 30s, 1930s that you know it was important to protect wetlands and he, he bought uh, several hundred thousand acres of wetlands and protected them and continued to protect them until his death in 1965 so you know it, it's been under his protection since uh, a lot of it since the 30s and now what's unique about it is that we are a foundation dedicated to protect an area right in the middle of the cities of Orange, West Orange and Pinehurst and the way we're protecting it is basically letting Mother Nature do what she needs to do and not letting man interfere. identified more than uh, 90 species of birds out there. Uh, there's river otters, there's beaver, there's of course nutria which are um, of course alligator is a real popular thing for the kids to see. Uh, we have a, a tremendous uh, uh, diversity of fish in that bayou system and uh, that leads us to, to discuss the fact that the, the biomass, the amount of living matter in that ecosystem is, is significant. In fact, it's equal to a tropical rainforest during the summer. And uh, so we, 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 we have a lot of different life in there, but uh, it, it ranges from the bottom organisms, organisms, the benthos, all the way up to the, the birds and the, the uh, top of the pyramid, creatures like osprey and, and periodically and eagle and, and things like that. Because we had a problem. The problem was is that we had uh, we had an island that had a collecting site that we wanted to use, and we had to get the kids from the from the mainland to the island. And we thought about a bridge, but then we found out that in 1856 there was a ferry there. It was called McLean's Ferry. So we replicated that ferry. We made it just as close to looking like the old ferry as possible. And today, that's how we take kids to the island is by way of the little hand-pulled ferry and it's very effective because it teaches history 
and it also is just a fun thing to do. Every group that we bring into the, uh, the Cypress Swamp, whether they're a preschool bunch or whether they're a high school uh, students, we try to develop relevancy for the research that they're doing because so while they were out there they did dissolved oxygen they found out how much oxygen was in the water which is an indicator of the life in the water to begin with they also looked at salinity they looked at pH and we also did a, 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 a cast net collection method to see what kind of fish were there and you put them in the aquarium Push the, rest, throw some in. the story that we tell them is a few years ago, a group came out, they did collection, the, the environment ledger came back and told me the pH in the bio was really high. Well, I immediately went out and found out that the uh, a construction group had dumped a, a bunch of uh, lime into the bayou system and it basically had a fish kill. We would have never known that if it wasn't for that eighth grade or seventh grade class taking samples and monitoring the bio. And, because we use it as education, we're out there almost every day. What people need to realize is that clear water doesn't mean clean water. Right. Clear water, uh, toxic water in North America is crystal clear. You know, there's no life in it. Just because the water has a lot of sediments or because the water, we call it a turbidity, it's very turbid, it's not very clear. Uh, you know, just because it's like that doesn't mean it doesn't have life. You know. want to test to find out the quality of water. A big misconception is that you can take samples of the water and tell everything. But as you can imagine, if you dump a toxic substance in a segment of the bayou, 10 minutes later it's gone. It's downstream. So it doesn't give you an indication of the, the, uh, the condition of the water. However, go ahead, if you go down and down. you collect the organisms that live on the bottom, organisms that don't move readily, not only does it tell you how the water is at that moment, but it also tells you the history of the bottom of that bayou or, or uh, river ecosystem. So we go down and we collect these creatures off the bottom, we take them back, we identify them, and those creatures tell us the history of the bayou. Because if a creature is living there at the time that we collect it, it's, since they don't move readily, it was also living there yesterday and the day before and the day before. And each creature tells its own story. If it's an organism that doesn't need much oxygen, then it tells you that there's not much oxygen in that water. If it's an organism that can only live in, in oxygen-rich environments, then it tells us that story. So benthos is what it's called. Bottom organisms are called benthos and we collect those organisms and it tells us the whole story much more accurately than anything else we do. You know, what we found out is because of the destruction of the wetlands, areas that did not have these natural barriers, areas that did not have the, uh, Mother Nature's protection were destroyed. And so all of these years that we basically you know, uh, slowly destroyed these aquatic ecosystems. You know, it's come back to haunt us now. And you know, it's, it's, it's up to everybody now to be aware that, you know, we can't build levees big enough to protect us. Mother Nature, she does a good job of it with her wetlands. So, you know, if anything they need to know is that, you know, we need to protect these wetland aquatic ecosystems so they'll provide this protection that, uh, for the future. You know, every day when you go out on, in, to Shangri-La, you never, and I, as many times as I got, you never ever know what you're going to see. You never know because one day it may be a beaver, the next day it may be a bobcat, and the next day it may be some really unusual bird that we, we catch as part of our research in, in bird banding. I'd have to say that I like to learn about, you know, all the small species that they have around in the ecology. And like even the smallest creatures have the biggest impact, you know. I think the most important thing that I learned today was how many creatures depend on the natural ecosystem out there and how much it's worth protecting.
Have you ever wondered how many fish there are along the Texas coast? Or what kind of fish are out there? Or how about how old they are? These are all questions that the researchers at the Coastal Fisheries Lab on Pleasure Island answer on a daily basis. Hey, my name is Terry Staley. I'm a fisheries biologist with the Texas Parks and Wildlife. And part of our job is to monitor fish and shrimp populations or crustaceans in general up and down the coast using various types of gear. And we do this both inshore and offshore. The computer tells us where to go. We have our system divided up into grids or blocks. One degree of latitude by one degree of longitude and each of them are numbered. After the computer randomly decides which grid the researchers will take their samples from, the fishermen go to their designated area and use all kinds of different equipment on the boat to bring in their catch. I learned how to use the MPS. It's like a probe that you put in the water and it tells about the, how much oxygen is in the water and how much the uh, fish needs and what the temperature is in the water. They use things like a 20-foot trawl, oyster dredge, GPS navigator, autopilot, depth finder, radio, and many other types of equipment that help them bring in their catch. Once the researchers catch the fish, they record several things about them, including length, weight, gender, and age. Algebra is greatly used in this field of study. By measuring just the length of a fish, researchers can determine the weight and even the age of the fish without having to dissect it. Not only does the length help to determine the age of the fish, but a researcher can also age the species by inspecting its spine, scales, or by cutting open the head of the fish and taking out what is called the otoliths. The otolith is a small bony structure located in the fish's head that acts as an ear to help the fish with balance. As the fish grows, so do the otoliths. Students got to look firsthand at just how these researchers go about collecting these otoliths. We're going to go after those stones and I want somebody to come saw this fish. There you got it right there? Okay. Okay, all the fish. Get your cut started. There you go, now go straight down. Pull that old lift out. Okay, that's an older lift right there. Okay. You get to see all the parts inside and like where all the stuff is in there. It was nasty. I didn't want to cut it. I wanted him to cut it, but I pulled out the um ovules and everything. Once the otoliths are taken out of the head of the fish, a researcher can cut them into tiny pieces and count the rings to determine its age. Well, you can crack it open and then the, the lines in it, if you cut it a certain way, like you cut it horizontally, and you can tell what the lines and marks inside it. The students also learned a little about the shrimping industry, or at least what they taste like. Texas coastal wetlands bring in a yearly harvest of about $200 million. Now that's a lot of shrimp. Before the students leave, they get up close and personal with one of the top natural predators beneath the surface, the freshwater bull shark. These sharks come to our estuaries on the Texas coast seeking a nursery ground for their offspring. Our estuaries make a perfect nursery ground because of the freshwater, thick marsh areas, and the large Sabine and Natchez rivers. Not only did students get to saw the head off of a fish and calculate its age, but they take home a better understanding of just how vital the Texas wetlands are to the growth and development of our marine environment.
Alligators are the top non-human predators in Texas wetlands, and we just happen to live where they love to hunt. An alligator has a big bite. An estimated 2,500 pounds per square inch of pressure is what this baby's bite will be when it grows up. The alligator beats even hyenas and the king of the jungle by a whopping 1,500 pounds of pressure. Compare that to the pit bull and the gator wins by over 2,000 pounds and the alligator beats the human bite pressure by 2,400 pounds per square inch. Now that's a big bite. Just in case you didn't know already. The difference between a crocodile and alligator is their teeth, the, the shape and the length, and how many teeth that they have. When you're around alligators, you shouldn't feed them and you shouldn't walk towards them. Some of the alligator's favorite foods live just around the corner at Smith Woods Water Bird Rookery. Alligators are attracted to rookeries because some young birds don't survive and that makes an easy snack for the predators. But the gators aren't there just to eat. They serve a larger purpose. Alligators also protect rookeries from tree climbing predators like raccoons and snakes. The alligators protect all the birds. They keep as the, well as eat them. <laughs> they yeah, protect well, them they keep like the raccoons and coyotes from eating the birds, so as, only they can eat them. As do the water that's surrounding the whole island. I mean, the whole lo little nesting place. Uh, water surrounds it, so therefore it's like protecting it, protecting it. So certain animals, as raccoons and other squirrels and other things, won't be able to get on the other side and like eat the baby's offspring. Back at J.D. Murphy Wildlife Management Area, the students get a first-hand look into the life of alligators. The adult alligators, uh, baby alligators, the, the adult alligators will eat the baby alligators, and the, the baby alligators will you know, eat smaller fish. There's two kinds of alligators. There's the American alligator and the Chinese alligator, and they can drown, the babies can drown if like their eggs stay underwater too long. After an airboat ride through the waters, these students learn that gators are not the only animals making the Texas wetlands their homes, but so are many different species of ducks. Officials at the refuge monitor the ducks in an interesting way. We'll collect gizzards from model ducks throughout the whole season. At the end of the season, lots of other biologists from all over the area, primarily around the uh, waterfowl area, the coast we will come up here and we'll all have two days of a big giant gizzard cut. A gizzard is sort of an organ, I guess, in, a, in an animal, and it's shaped like a bean. And uh, there are muscles in it, and some animals don't have teeth, and so they have to swallow their food whole. And the muscles in the gizzard crushes up the food so that it makes it easier to digest. Just getting to see the inside and see how it works, it's pretty interesting. Gizzards aren't the cleanest part of the birds to dissect, and the students learned that firsthand. They found dirt, seeds, and remnants of pellets from hunters inside the gizzards they cut open. We took magnets after we cut open the gizzards and um, found lead inside of it and everything. That's why we went to steel shot. We got all this lead out there and it's contaminates the soil. When it gets into those dust, when they eat it, it gets into their gizzard, kills them if they get too much in there. After a day of gizzard cutting, gator holding, and airboat rides, the students feel they have actually learned something new, and now they have an appreciation for the Jason Project. because it's hands-on learning instead of just in the classroom and hands-on learning you can really it's a real ex, real life experience so you remember it much longer than learning from a textbook you are going to use science for the rest of your life it's not just something that teachers tell you to make you pay attention you really will use science every day I learned that if we protect it then we get to enjoy it and get to learn from it you actually get to like experience it you get to watch everything happen in front of you. The difference from being in a classroom and actually experiencing it yourself is that you can explore it. Out here you can explore it.
coming today. We hope to see you again next year when Jason explores Monster Storms.